Hello, hello. How are you doing? When I click my fingers, you will all wake up. Hey, it worked. Good. Hi. Oh, it's cold in here, isn't it? Are your, are your bottoms hurting? Can, can I make a suggestion? Just have a bit of a shake. How about standing up? Try clenching and unclenching your butts. <laughs> Move your shoulders. Get comfortable. Oh, you needed that, didn't you? I can hear these, these sighs of satisfaction. <laughs> Sitting down to look. How about doing some ballet in, order, in, in honor of Natalie? <laughs> great. OK, you can sit down now. That feel better? Good. Uh, it's great to be in this school. You know, um, I, was a really, I was a really naughty kid at school. But, uh, you know, one thing, one thing I want to share with you. When I was, uh, when I was uh, in primary school, we had a careers advisor. They decided to teach us about careers early. So she would go around the class saying, and what do you want to be when you grow up? And what do you want to be? And you had to choose, like, really early. I was an incredibly dreamy kid. And she got to me, Yuri, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I would like to be a tree. <laughs> and she said, you cannot be a tree. She said, choose something human. I will ask you again next week. So this was a big problem for me. Uh, what do I want to be? Now, I spent all my time reading books. And I was reading this really amazing book called The Sword in the Stone. Anybody read that? Ah, oh, it's such a great book. Um, it's about King Arthur. It's about a guy with a big sword who just chops people's heads off. I thought, cool. The next Friday came along and the teacher said, Now, Nuri, what do you want to be? So I said, I would like to be King Arthur. <laughs> now, she thought I said, an author. So she told the other teachers, that kid wants to be an author. The other teachers told my secondary school teachers, my secondary school teachers told my parents. It went into my university reference letters. And now, years later, I am an author. <laughs> now, the moral of this story is speak clearly, or you will change the trajectory of your whole life. Now, um, it became very clear after a while that I was not going to be King Arthur. But I was very similar to my Uncle Arthur. Now, Uncle Arthur was not really my uncle. I mean, he was white. But you know your parents' friends, you, they get called uncle. I lived in Sri Lanka, so we called him Arthur Uncle. <laughs> no, the accent and the head shake. <laughs> Arthur Uncle lived near us in Sri Lanka. And he was a bit crazy. He was a mad scientist type. Um, he was officially there for scuba diving, but really, he was a gay guy who had accidentally married a woman and was in hiding. Sri Lanka is a good place to hide out. So he was there, and I loved Uncle Arthur. He was so mad. He was so mad. He had this theory that if you took a radio and fired it into the sky, and fired it to a certain level, it would stay there forever and it would turn as the world turned. Uncle Arthur had a rock on his bookshelf, and he said, it's a piece of the moon. Somebody went up and got it for me. Uncle Arthur wrote books for a living uh, and posted them to London, where they were published. Uncle Arthur hated the word birthday. He said, you're only born once. All the rest are orbits. So he'd say, I am on my latest orbit of the sun, instead of saying, I'm having another birthday. <laughs> um, I loved Uncle Arthur, and he was a good inspiration to me. And you know what? Uncle Arthur wrote science fiction books. I became a writer. I wrote loads of books, including quite a few science fiction books. I remember saying to a friend when I started out, um, I said, I'm going to write real science books. I'm going to write hard science fiction. Hard science is, it doesn't mean difficult science. Hard science means solid science, real science. And uh, those are the sort of books that uh, I was going to work on. Now, years passed, and I met some of my old friends. And one of them said to me, 
hard science. You don't write hard science books. You write about stuff like, you write time travel. Uh, you write stuff about other dimensions. And you seem to be obsessed with this idea that we are trapped in a matrix and an alien intelligence has created us. And uh, I said, yeah, I do like those ideas. But in fact, they're all hard science. And I'm going to share with you the answer that I gave him. You know, the thing about Uncle Arthur, the thing that really inspired me about him was that he was very scientific, but he was also very mystical. He hated religion, but he was very religious. Um, he switched from side to side. He was everything at once. And uh, that's very much what I wanted to be as well. First, time travel. OK, that's fiction, right? It isn't fiction. Uh, one of my first science fiction books was based on Einstein's theory of relativity. Anybody read that? Do you know it's the birthday of that book? It was 1915 that uh, Einstein released the general theory of relativity. 100 years ago this year, I think we ought to have a party or something, don't you? Anyway, it's a, it's, a really, it's a really horrible book to read, actually. He's a terrible writer. But the book is basically uh, an instruction book, how to build a time machine. It's about how time can be bent and stretched and, ma and made malleable. It's a fantastic book. Uh, and nobody's yet made the time machine described in that book. But Einstein showed that it can be done. And we now know, because of Einstein, that if you travel just below the speed of light, you can travel around the universe in your lifetime. When you get back, it'll be in the far future. And you'll feel like you've traveled in time. Because from your point of view, you have. Now, don't let anybody tell you that that is not science. That is science. Secondly, um, other dimensions. I like other dimensions. Uh, the hero of the other dimensions thing is a guy called Niels Bohr. He, uh, he's the father of something called quantum physics. Anybody studied quantum mechanics here? Mm, you might do it. Oh, you, we've got a couple. That's good. Uh, it's, so, it's so cool, quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics is basically uh, the discovery that reality is not quite what we think it is. If we open up particles down to their deepest parts, we find something strange. We find they don't exist at all. They're just probabilities until they've been consciously measured. Then they start to exist. They crystallize into existence. It's a very strange and cool idea. It reminded me of something Uncle Arthur said. He said one of the, his favorite texts was, Reality is a dream in the mind of God. I thought, wow, that's mystical, isn't it? Especially from a scientist. Uh, it's a very, very ancient text. Um, particle physics, uh, quantum physics. Uh, this sounds weird, but it's true. You can take a particle, break it into twins, and you can put them at opposite ends of the universe. And then you make a conscious measurement of one and it starts it spinning. The other one on the other side of the universe starts spinning at the same time. Why? Because, according to Niels Bohr, in the real world, there's no such thing as distance. Because this world is an illusion. Niels Bohr said there's no such thing as observer-independent reality. Cool. Now you can see why Science fiction authors love quantum physics. So don't let anybody tell you that other dimensions are not science. This is real science. Um, the universe, do we live in the matrix? Anybody seen that wonderful movie from a few years ago? Well, in the, in in the mid-1960s, a, uh, a scientist named Carter did some measurements, did some maths, and he said, you know what? This universe is highly improbable. He'd done the maths to, uh, to see how if there was a Big Bang and helium and hydrogen were created, how that could splinter off into a universe this big and this complicated. And he said, it's actually rather unlikely. Another scientist did some more measurements, and so did another, and so did another, including some big names like Stephen Hawking and Stephen Weinberg. And they all came to the same conclusion. 
we live in a highly improbable universe. Um, the head of the Royal Society, that's the, the world's historically top science organization, took it on himself to do all the maths. And he said, yes, well, uh, actually, um, the chances of this universe being random is uh, 100,000 to 1. And then he tr did some more with some more data. No, it's a billion to 1. He did some more with some more data. It's a, a quintillion to 1. He concluded in a famous book in 1999 that um, this was not a random universe. And what does that mean if this is not random? Well, either alien intelligence created this universe, or there's an infinite number of universes, and we live in a multiverse. I love both those ideas. Both those ideas are great for science fiction writers. I mean, I kind of like the multiverse idea. If there's an infinite number of universes, that means that everything that can happen is happening somewhere. That means somewhere there is a universe exactly like this one, except Emma Watson is in love with me. <laughs> There's a universe somewhere which is exactly like this one, except Dylan O'Brien is in love with you. OK. <laughs> That's what infinite number of, of universes means. Isn't it a cool idea for a science fiction writer? What about the other alternative? That's also popular. And, um, the idea that there's a consciousness somewhere behind this reality. And uh, if you're interested in that, look up Martin Rees or Nick Bostrom or John Gribbin. These are science writers who are interested in that idea. Um, what is the name of this alien? What do we call it? Alien intelligence. God. Allah. <laughs> Jessica. We don't know. We don't know what it's called. We just know it might be there. And it's either the multiple universe idea or the alien intelligence. I don't mind. I think they're both wonderful ideas. But you know what? Putting these ideas together, quantum physics, reality, other dimensions, alien intelligences, and I realized something. Uncle Arthur was right, you know. Maybe reality is a dream in the mind of God. You know, I last saw Uncle Arthur in uh, 2008. He had just, he told me, completed his 90th orbit of the sun. Uncle Arthur actually became quite famous. Everything he'd told me turned out to be true, although I didn't realize it till years later. He was friendly with the Apollo astronauts, and that piece of rock on his bookshelf actually was from the moon. One of the astronauts had sent it to him. Uncle Arthur's idea, shooting radios into the sky uh, as a useful thing to have up there, it was true. If you go to Wikipedia today and look up geostationary satellites, you'll find Arthur's name there as one of the creators of the idea of satellites. Today, there are 2,465 radios circling the Earth. They've been shot up, and they stay exactly where they are. That's why they're called geostationary. And his idea, all those years ago, uh, helped create um, satellites. And that's why you can make international phone calls uh, today. You know, if you want to be, um, be open-minded, be like Arthur. Be pro-science, be anti-science. Be pro-religious, be anti-religious. Be mystical, be open-minded. Just be ready for anything. Uh, don't be one of those people who thinks, oh, it's not cool to believe that, or it's not cool to believe that. Uh, believe everything, question everything. Question everything is a lovely old phrase. It comes from a very uh, old book, and it's still valid today as it was when it was written in mm, 2000. Uh, years ago. Um, let me leave you uh, with, uh, with one last uh, message. You know, one thing my teacher at primary school taught me that was very useful. She said, choose someone you admire and model your life on that person. So I chose Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> hey, don't laugh. Bye-bye.